Start trading crypto today. Sign up for our step-by-step video series to get set up with the best trading tools, start analyzing charts, enter and exit a trade properly, and most importantly, see if crypto trading is right for you. Join us at bitlabacademy.com. Welcome to Rice TVX. You have entered into the realm of stranger than fiction. On today's transmission, I am joined by galactic historian and author Ismael Perez, and we're going to be talking about his best-selling book, Our Cosmic Origin. Before we get into it, right now, you can save $250 on a three-month food kit from My Patriot Supply. It is their lowest price in three years to help you fight inflation. Go to prepwithrice.com and get your $250 savings on this three-month emergency food kit. That's prepwithrice.com. We have coming food shortages, global food supply chain issues, fertilizer is scarce and expensive, farming problems. Be smart, be prepared, not scared. You can also save $50 on a four-week emergency food supply. Visit prepwithrice.com. I will include links in the video description for everything I just mentioned, as well as everything shared on today's video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, joining me on today's show is author Ismael Perez, and his book is called Our Cosmic Origin, Knowledge, and Preparation for the Ascension of Our Planet. Ismael, welcome to Rice TVX. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me here. I'm so excited. Well, thank you again for your time, man. I really appreciate it. I'm definitely looking forward to the conversation. And everything that we talk about on today's show is going to be linked down below in the video description. If you don't mind, for people who may be unfamiliar with you, Ismael, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. My name is Ishmael Perez, the author of Our Cosmic Origin, uh, revealing the suppressed galactic history of the Earth, uh, revealing the um, cosmic organization of the universe, of the multiverse, may I say, uh, suppressed history, uh, bridging the gap between cutting-edge science and ancient metaphysical knowledge, well, in an effort to explain our purpose, where we come from, and where we're heading. So it is a book that explains pretty much everything in a nutshell. Um, at the same time, I consider myself an awakened starseed. I've been awakened ever since I was a child. I knew I wasn't from this world, and I knew that I wasn't the only extraterrestrial that volunteered to come into human form. And uh, I've been, um, ever since I discovered meditation at the age of 21, I've been on this long journey to uncover the secrets and the mysteries of the cosmos and that's how our cosmic origin came about that's definitely fascinating man and um i mean i know that you and i don't really know each other very well i i call myself an open-minded skeptic i said uh, i said i was a little skeptical before we started recording and i'm just one of these guys that really wants to see proof and i know that not all things are you know exist that way unfortunately which is uh but i'm just one of these guys you know it's like i i believe in the idea of life beyond this planet but i've never witnessed anything that i'm aware of to be able to say without a shadow of a doubt that this is the case but one thing i will say you know it seems like what you're talking about is almost hidden history and but on more of a galactic level and i'm I'm a big fan of history. I know that we've been lied to. So with that being said, I'm definitely open to exploring these ideas 100%. And so I'd, I'm really curious, like if for somebody who is, is interested in, in purchasing your book, what is the basic concept behind what you've written in Our Cosmic Origin? is that we have um, a stellar and galactic uh, ancestry, that the human beings on the Earth are not unique to this planet. There are uh, many worlds, many galaxies, and even many universes with human-like beings. In fact, about 75% of the cosmos are humanoids. And what I mean by humanoids is that there are different extraterrestrials that, are, that look just like us, but they're on different levels of spiritual and technological uh, 
advancement. And so the premise of this book is to also remind everybody that our origin wasn't even, you know, uh, in the physical, that we began as great spiritual beings of the one, and we originated in the higher dimensions. From the top down, we were involved in this process that I call involution, which is the descent of spirit into matter until we reach, we reach the, the lowest frequency or the lowest vibrational point of this matter or energy matter vibration. And then that's how we became physical. So that is the premise of the book is to remind people of their celestial origin, that we are multidimensional beings, that, that we are great spiritual beings and that we are temporarily existing in human form. But that also has a purpose. Another thing that I like to talk about is the fact that the true meaning of ascension is the integration of spirit and matter. It is the anchoring of all the different aspects of yourself, your etheric self, your astral self, your uh, spiritual self, uh, and integrating it and anchoring it into the here and the now so that we could spiritualize matter and make matter eternal. And that is the reason why we're here. We're here to anchor in the higher dimensions and integrate them with the lower dimensions. I love it. And you, you used the word involution, which I thought was interesting as an opposite to evolution. Um, I'm surprised you didn't use the word devolution, but uh, do you mind kind of going on, just explaining what this involution, how you came up with that idea? Well, yeah. So involution is the opposite of evolution. Evolution is, is uh, in terms of like the universe uh, fragmentalizing and dividing itself from the one into the many. That's the evolutionary process. That is the uh, process that um, where we all start off as one and we just kind of go through this division and each fractal continues to divide itself. But due to the fact that we do live in a holographic uh, creation, we are all still part of the same oneness at the highest levels of reality. So the involutionary part is the, the separation. It is the part that uh, sets in the illusion that everything is separated, that me and you are two different people, that me and the plants behind me are two different things. But in essence, we're all part of the same oversoul. We're all different expressions of the one. So involution is the opposite. It is, it is the spirit through a process of lowering its frequency, gradually condensing itself and becoming more denser and more solid. Now, the opposite of involution is evolution, which is... Again, the bouncing back up from the point of being pure physical and then bouncing back up into becoming spiritual again. So that's what I call involution. It is the opposite of evolution. So in terms of the Eastern teachings, we could say that, you know, uh, the, the in-breath of God or the out-breath of God is the involutionary process. That's the out-breath. That is when the one expands. So the expansion of the cosmos is also uh, related to the involutionary process. Now, the contraction of the cosmos, which is coming back together as one through the ascension process, that's known as the evolutionary process. So they work hand in hand. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and when you when you mention also to the older soul and kind of us being a part of a collective, is this kind of the idea that all of us individually make up what is known as source, God, creator? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. And I've heard you mention it because I haven't had a chance to read your book, but I, I have heard you mention the idea that there is a prime creator, a universal architect, and you equate that with what most people would equate with source creator of everything, God, from that perspective. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. It is where everything comes from, including the overseers and uh, creator gods of local universes. They're all they all stem from the one. So everything and in in and in, in everything that, that we know and don't know encompasses the prime architect. Correct. Absolutely. And that's fascinating. That's fascinating. One of the other things now that I because I did listen to your interview with Rex Bear from League Project, which was an interesting interview. Uh he seemed to be as skeptical when it comes to a lot of the um secret space program stuff. But you mentioned about the idea that what we know from a scientific standpoint, as far as our universe or universes, what we know that is, is making up really about 4% of the entirety of everything. And you explained that the other portion, whether it be the 96% is kind of a dark matter, dark energy and mentioning life and colonies with the in this dark matter or dark energy. Can you elaborate a little bit more into that aspect? 
Sure. So when astronomers pierce into the with their telescopes into the sky, they're only detecting galaxies. Everything else to them appears to be dark or all this empty space in between galaxies. Well, there is no, no such thing as empty space. Even the so-called empty space or what we would consider dark matter and dark energy is full of life. <laughs> it is life vibrating at higher frequencies that are undetectable by scientific instruments or the five senses. So when we're piercing into the cosmos, we're only piercing the 4%. The other 96% has a lot to do with the realms of the uh, levels of reality that exist beyond the galactic, the galactic spheres into the realms of the uh, local universes, into the realms of the minor cosmic sectors, major cosmic sectors, uh, eventually reaching the realms of the super universe, which is a conglomerate of millions of local universes, and then finally the realms of the always existing motherverse, the omniverse, or the central universe. So that's, that, um, cons that is part of the other 96% of the so-called missing matter. So in other words, the galaxies are existing within local universes, right? Each local universe is a conglomerate of different galaxies. And then in turn, each local universe with other local universes make up a, a greater cosmic body. So the galaxies exist within larger uh, fields or bodies uh, of cosmos that are undetectable by the naked eye or our scientific instruments, which consist of civilizations uh, beyond type three and type four, all the way up, all the way up to type five. So. Technically, there's uh, five different categories of, it, of civilizations that exist in the multiverse. We technically here on the Earth are considered type zero <laughs> compared to the type one, two, three, four, and five that exist. And that's wild to think about uh, because, I mean, if we're type zero, imagine how beyond where we are in our evolutionary growth uh, in, in life and in technology compared to someone that a, a species that's more advanced. I mean, that's, and that's definitely where I guess things like space travel and things like that could be possible, uh, having technologies and things that we just have no comprehension of. And you mentioned, like, I've heard you talking about some ways of explaining our universe and how it's made up and different sectors, seven different universes, something to this effect. I'm, I may be jumbling some of the information. Um, if you could explain that a little bit more in detail about Earth, where we are, like where is our place in this giant cosmos? Okay, so basically we've been lied to about our universe. Uh, we're actually part of a multiverse. Our universe is one of many universes. And in a sense, our universe is one gigantic cell at a cosmic level of reality with other universes that make up a, a, an even greater cosmic body known as the central mother universe. So from the bottom up, our, our planetary sphere, Earth, is considered planetary sphere number 606 within a system that consists uh, anywhere between 600 and 1,000 worlds. So our Earth belongs to the 24th system out of 100,000 systems. So the 24th system is also known as the Pleiadians with Alcyon on the central sun in the seven sisters. So our solar system is known as the eighth missing sister in that cluster of stars. So okay. we're part of the 24th system. Every, every planet within that system uh, has a number, is registered. Uh, and then our system with about 100,000 other systems make up a constellation body. Now the constellation body that we're part of is known as Sirius. Sirius is the, um, the, the body that we belong to and it is registered as number 70 out of 100 other constellations. Now, Sirius number 70 with 100 other constellations make up a local universe. So we're part of the local universe of Nebadon. And the local universe of Nebadon is registered as number 84 within a greater body of cosmos. So our local universe with about 100 million other universes make up a cosmic minor sector. And there's only about 100 cosmic minor sectors, each one with about 100 million universes. And our cosmic minor sector known as Ansra is registered as number three out of the 100. And even within the cosmic minor, minor sector of Ansra, uh, our cosmic minor sector also belongs to a, a bigger body of cosmos known as the major sector of Splendon or the cosmic major sector of Splendon. And there's only about 10 of those. So we belong to the cosmic major sector uh, registered as number five out of the 10. And then those 10 major cosmic sectors collectively make up a super universe segment. So we belong to super universe number seven. 
uh, which is known as Orvington. And Orvington is, is one seventh of the entire grand central creation or the grand creation of the motherverse. Now from the top down, we could say that we are part of the seventh super universe, fifth cosmic major sector, third minor cosmic major sector, uh, 84th local universe, 70th constellation, and the system of the, the 24th system. And then within that system, we register as planetary number 606 with Venus being planetary 607 and Mars being planetary 605. And that's how everything's registered. 605. Yeah. 600, okay, because I think when you were on um, Leak Project, and that was going to be one of my questions, you mentioned that Venus was 607 and Mars was 604 and the Earth was 606, which made me want to know what was 605. Maybe well, there was just a jumbling up of numbers. That's a lot of, I mean, you, you gave a lot of information and there was a lot of numbers being thrown out. So it, if something would have happened to have just gotten a little bit mixed up, I totally understand. But so the, uh, it, it is uh, Mars is 605, Venus is 607 and we're 606? Correct. Okay. And like, where do you, uh, like, because you know, this is where the, the open-minded skeptic in me, where do you obtain information like this? And where do you, and, and where do you obtain in, this kind of information to be able to put forth in your book, Our Cosmic Origin? Well, first they came through uh, many uh, series of downloads. I, I've been getting transmissions from the galactics uh, for many, many years. And also the second aspect of this is me doing the research to investigate to see if there's any solid scientific confirmation, and it is. But the scientific confirmation that I received came from the highly classified organization known as the CIO, which is an ultra secret group that is associated with the breakaway groups commonly known as the secret space programs. So the ACIO, the Advanced Contact of Intelligent Organization, has already validated that our Stargate number is 753-8470, 24 and 606 interesting what it, now that's our that is earth's individual stargate number per your research or is that like our galaxies uh both yes okay uh, yeah and uh when, when uh these intelligences from the level of the super universes which it, you know oc occupy dimensions beyond the 12 all the way up to the 24th uh, when they want to uh, access any planet, any sphere, any level of reality, all they do is they plug in the stargates. That's it. And they're there within minutes, within seconds, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. They open up the portal and they could transmit themselves or teleport any to any part of the motherverse or the multiverse in just one second by plugging in the stargates. That's fascinating. And, and also, I heard you mention that you know, obviously we're part of this bigger co cosmos. There's an organized multiverse. And when you mentioned the prime creator and the universal architect, you also said that math and gematria is a universal language throughout the multiverses. Um, when, when I heard you say that, one of the, I wanted to specify because I'm not an expert in the area of gematria, but from what I understand, there's several different types of gematria. Is well, there is there a specific type of gematria that's that's considered what you consider to be the universal language of the multiverse? Yes, they are the the initial or what I call the original authentic gematria has to do with the fact that uh, everything's a simulation, everything's pixelated at the quantum level. I mean, at the uh, smallest scale of reality, and it is through these geometric uh, symbols or the geometries that the sound frequency vibrations that precipitate matter into solidity exist. So everything comes from geometry. Uh, some equates the sixth dimension with the, with the realm of geometry, you know, uh, precipitating um, matter into existence. Uh, but the original geometry um, comes from Metatron, the Archangel Metatron. He is the facilitator of the, uh, of the blueprints and the different templates that uh, generate the simulations on every level of reality. So sim the simulation exists all the way to 12 dimensions. Beyond the 12 dimension, then we begin to go into the pure base, uh, pure energy, pure, uh, what, what scientists would call, um, you know, base reality. Yeah, I heard you mention 12 dimensions and then something, because I wrote down some notes and I want to make sure I present this correctly. 12 dimensions, but there was something about 15 and time. Oh, the and, then, 
and then I, going and then going into infinity. Right. Well, the fifteen dimensional time matrix, uh, which is the uh, the I guess this is where everyone exists. All the extraterrestrials, all the living intelligences, all the different types of advanced civilizations exist within the fifteen dimensional time matrix. Beyond the fifteen dimensional time matrix, uh, those are the realms of, of eternity or infinity. So we're dealing with finite systems. So our universe is a finite system, right? It had a beginning and it will have an end. Every universe is part of the finite system. So in the 15 dimensional time matrix, um, all realities that exist below the 12 density or the 12 dimension are considered finite. All realities that exist beyond the 13th dimension are now considered, uh, they're part of the eternal life systems of the motherverse. And so therefore they're part of eternity. They become part of eternity. So our universe is heading into that direction. As our universe ascends, it becomes um, immortalized. You know, it becomes part of the, uh, it connects back to the uh, eternal life systems of the mother universe, which has always existed, you know, be, be, without beginning or end. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I was going to ask. So we go from a system that's finite to a system that's infinite. So the reverse, that's pretty, that's pretty fascinating to think about that because that would be, you know, like what I think about with, uh, our evolution, um, you know, is evolving to that point. So we are currently in the three D from from all perspectives that we can recognize. Yeah, we're in the lowest uh, density dimension, whatever you want to call it, that exists within this uh, light energy spectrum uh, that it's that encompasses the fifteen dimensional time matrix. Yeah, so we're in the lowest space of that, but now we're we're bouncing back up as our planet ascends. And is that part of being you know, going into the age of Aquarius? Absolutely. Yeah, the Aquarius is going to be the beginning of us entering the fourth, fifth, and sixth densities or dimensions. And that's part of the ascension process. Correct. Now, how do just with you know from from your research? I mean, how do we go about achieving what you just stated? And will everyone? be elevated to that status per se or to that state or will there be some that may be left behind because i've heard ideas that when we ascend that there'll be people that uh get kind of stuck on this 3d earth or this 3d matrix and there will be others that are more in tuned with the things that you mentioned and and moving forward and ascending and going into a, a, a different aspect of life as we know it well, yeah, it's both, you know, those that are doing the work, those that are waking up, um, they're going to be part of the new earth, the new fifth dimensional reality. Um, and some are even going to be part of the fourth dimensional reality, which is still a better world than this one. Uh, for those that are still stuck in the third dimensional cycle, um, they're going to be uh, recycled back into a different planet uh, that's still existing in the third dimension. And they're going to wait till that planet goes through its own stellar activation cycle, which is what our planet is currently undergoing. To, for them to have the opportunity to ascend uh, in that life lifespan as well. Okay. Can you briefly describe what the other dimensions are made up of? Like the, what is the, cause I've heard of fourth dimension and I've always heard people talk about the idea and I've read it in a lot of different research that we ascend from 3d to the 5d. And I've always wondered why we skipped over the 4d but I've always been curious, what are these dimensions individually up to the 12th dimension? Well, they're all different simulations and they're all held together by geometries. So the third, dimensions, the third dimension is held together by tetrahedrons. The fourth dimension is held together by the tesseract. And the fifth dimension is held, held together by the do, dokesohedron, dokesohedron. And then the sixth dimension is held together by the isocohedron. And then, so every dimension is is, is uh, generated by a ge geometrical pattern. The, the geometries are the ones that are sending the, the um, sound wave frequencies, uh, the sound that per per precipitates light uh, congealing into matter. And so every dimension is is different. You know, the higher we go in dimensions, the less denser you become and the more immortal you become. So for instance, intelligences that are visiting us from the fourth dimension have a lifespan of about a thousand or 2000 years. Uh, beings that come from the fifth dimension have lifespans of thousands and thousands of years. So that explains why the fifth dimensional galactics who existed in ancient times were wrongly classified as gods. 
all extra, all all gods from mythology, all the stories that we hear about in these books, they were all extraterrestrials. Just more advanced. Exactly. So the higher we go in dimension, the more immortal we become, the greater the lifespan. And also the body becomes less denser. And you become more in tune with your multidimensionality. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's pretty wild. Now, when um, you mentioned parad paradiso or paradise type dimensions beyond a certain element, is that beyond the sixth element? So everything from seven to twelve would be more uh, para paradise oriented. Is that the way I understood the way you were explaining it? It's from the fifth dimension and up, where paradise paradisical worlds exist. From the fifth dimension up. But there is no evil you know the polarity has fully been balanced and everything is is in a state of uh, balance of peace and um, everyone is part of this unity consciousness where everybody sees the christ and everyone else okay speaking of i love the way that you have those wings perfectly placed right beside your head it, it's uh it, it's it's perfect for the video it's good placement um i don't know if you did that on purpose when you mentioned geometry are you talking about like sacred geometry well, yes, it is. Geometry is a living language across the universe. It's actually, even geometry itself is intelligent, by the way, just like gravity is intelligent in the electromagnetic field. So geometry is at the basis of all simulations, all realities. Beyond the simulations where we consider, uh, where, where, which is what scientists call base reality, uh, there is no geometry. Everything is just pure energy. Okay. Now you also mentioned simulations, um, which I've heard this, the simulation theory. I did a video uh, last night with a friend of mine, uh, channel Donut Factory. I've got to connect you. We're recording this on the 27th of August and it'll be released in just a couple of days, just so people are aware of the, the timestamp. But when you mention the simulations and how the simulations vary per dimension, is that only for the finite realities? Because like once we pass the 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 time matrix and get into what we would consider the the infinity, is that taking us beyond the simulation? Is that what is truly what we would call in in earthly terms reality? Correct. That is pure base reality, eternal reality. That's yeah, and that's. I would love to get to a point where I could, because it sounds based off of what I've listen to from you that if we were in tune with our higher selves and in in that correct walk that we would have recollections of us in the past you know who we were and to get an idea because of, i've also have heard many people people ch say that we chose to be here in this time period and you mentioned as a from an extraterrestrial standpoint choosing to come into this flesh suit to do this mission can you can you expand a little bit more on that and this idea that that we in some form or another in some different life or again i don't know how to even define these things how we would have chosen to be in this particular time that we are in right now which seems to be very very pivotal in a lot of different ways but from a spiritual and cosmological standpoint it's almost like a, a coming together of all these different cycles and different things that just happen to be harmonic to the point that we're in now to be completing multiple different stages of evolution and growth for it, everything that we know. That sounded really crazy and complicated, but I hope it made sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. So. As multidimensional beings, uh, not only do we occupy avatars here in the third dimension, uh, but we also have avatars that exist all the way to the twelfth dimension. Beyond the twelfth dimensions, then we don't have any more avatars or suits. So each avatar vibrates at a different frequency. And again, the higher we go, the more immortal the avatar becomes. So the reason we volunteer to come to the Earth is because the Earth is actually the most important planet in the multiverse. It is the melting pot, rather, the am amalgamation. Uh, to the cosmic community, she is known as the living library. And so at one point, the Earth was heading in a negative trajectory in the 1950s uh, due to the, uh, the development of the atom bomb. And so that's when Mother Earth um, called out. You know, she pretty much uh, 
decided to ask for help. And then that's when um, we volunteered. That's when we he heeded the call. And many of us, millions of us, decided to come in different waves. So the first wave of volunteers, and this is uh, validated by Dolores Cannon's work, uh, was in the 50s. You know, the second wave came in the late 60s, early 70s. And then the third wave came in the 80s and 90s. And then now the fourth wave. Now, I believe that as of 2000, yeah, as of the year 2000, every soul as is a star child. Every soul is an advanced soul in human form. And this perfectly ties in to what uh, some in the scientific community call the rise of the next stage of human evolution, which they call Homo Neoaticus. Which Homo ne Homo Neoticus? Neo. Yeah, Neo as in N-E-O-T-I-C-U-S. No, Neo Neoticus. Mm -hmm. Neoaticus, yeah. Okay. That's an interesting word. It's, and it kind of has that um, Roman Greek type vibe that seems to, to resonate throughout science, which is, which is pretty fascinating. Um, so when, when you think of, cause I'm trying to put this, this question together the right way. When you talk about prime creator and universal architect from an earthly standpoint, and I'm not a big fan of religion at all. Um, I call myself spiritual. I was raised from a traditional Christian standpoint. I don't identify in that aspect, but I do identify with following the examples that Christ left, following the way, which kind of resonates with a lot of different teachings throughout history here on our planet. What is, from your research, what or who is Christ in connection with prime creator is would it be prime creator source in it in the flesh or is this something different than from the what the bible and i know there could be a lot of manipulation and misconstrued history in the bible so that's that's why i wanted to ask you from your perspective well the term christ means the anointed you know it means a being that is already completed. And from my understanding, uh, he came from the future. You know, he, he's also known as the overseer and creator God of our local universe. And every universe has a Christ. Every universe has an omnipotent, omnipotent king and an omnipotent queen that oversees different realms within their perspective, respective universe. And so uh, the Christ is actually the logos. It's the universal mind of our universe becoming flesh. So... One of the things that I teach is that we live in a living conscious universe, that everything is alive. And this ties into the Greek philosophy of animism that states that animals have souls, plants have souls, rocks, everything in existence is alive and conscious. So universes are also living entities at a macro scale of reality. Galaxies are living entities, solar system stars, they're all part of the, of the body of the cosmos. And so... Christ was the embodiment, was the logos uh, that decided incarnates in order to complete his final bestowal so that he could become absolute sovereign son of his local creation. You know, and so every creator God undergoes seven bestowals or seven, um, seven in levels of initiation. Okay. Yeah. Um, absolute master son of their own creation. And so he, by... By him coming 2,000 years ago, uh, he actually completed his seven bestow. You know, he knew that he was going to be persecuted. He knew that he was going to be, you know, put to death on the cross. But again, you know, even death is an illusion. But he overcame that, you know, because he was also a master martial artist. He also trained with the yogis of India. He also trained with the Tibetans. Uh, and he traveled to Egypt and he learned from all the different um, spiritual masters. And so he brought those teachings to Jerusalem because they knew that he was the Logos. So they just kind of needed to remind him of his mission. Okay. No, I like the way you put that. And I mean, I've heard a lot of different ideas and theories that Jesus has traveled to like India, studied with um, Buddhist monks, uh, all kinds of different interesting things. There's actually, they claim that Jesus didn't die on the cross and went back to India and known as Isa and they, claim they know like where he's actually buried which is really that's well, very fascinating well that's the greatest secret and that is true because of his mastery of mind over matter um he overcame death 
And so when they took his, so yeah, they did crucify him, but he never died. You know, after the crucifixion, after the Roman armies left, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and the different, you know, Mary Magdalene, Mary, his mother, Martha, and the other people that were part of the community of Qunram back then known as the Essenes, which were, which were his people, they, they took him down from the cross and they, they used healing herbs and different healing modalities to cure him. And so, yeah, that was one of the great, greatest secrets that was kept from the existing ruling cabal under the guise of the Roman Empire during those days. And so they took him over to India where he healed. And then from India, he went over to France and he lived a long life in Spain. He actually ended up dying in Spain. He lived up to like 77. Okay. Okay. And he was That's... not Emmanuel, you know, that was can, his... can you repeat that last part? Esau Emmanuel. Esau Emmanuel. Okay. Um, there's a story. There's a. I have to send you a, a link to an interview that I did with a guy named Ralph Ellis. He wrote some really interesting books. Trying to, he calls himself a revisionary theologist, trying to place biblical events back in history where they actually took place because he says a lot of the things were just misconstrued on the dates. And he mentions a historical man that Jesus um, could have been or based on, uh, especially from the story standpoint from the Bible. And it, it's a king that comes from Edessa, and his name is Isus Emmanuel. So there is a lot of similarity in what you just said, which is very fascinating. So I'll send you that information. Now, pretty much everything that we just have talked about for the last half hour, is most all this like covered in your book? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But my book goes in greater detail. I mean, you know, it's uh, the most revealing book of the century, perhaps even the millennium since you know the catholic church has been suppressing any information regarding the true history of our world and you know extraterrestrials and our true cosmic origin um next level disclosure is kind of what i heard you say yeah it is that's what everyone that has read it has been telling me you know and these are people that know about secret space program that have you know done their own research and they all say I, I fill in the blanks for them in this book like this book is just it clicks it's an activator and many people are getting activated worldwide now is the only place people can buy the book over on Amazon or is there other places yeah just on Amazon right now okay I just want I wanted to give people options if people want to have you know if people aren't fans of Amazon and they can get it obviously on the Kindle version and paperback what made you decide to release it on September the 11th, almost uh, almost a year ago, actually? Um, I was I received a message from the Galactics telling me that the collective mind of the planet was ready for this knowledge. Uh, I, I actually, had, the manuscript was sitting for a few years. It was already written in 2016, 17. I had, I had completed the manuscript, Our Cosmic Origin. And the only reason I couldn't release it is because they kept telling me humanity's not ready for this type of knowledge. Give it a few more years. I said, all right. So after seven years, they told me, Ishmael, the time has come. We are reaching critical mass. Release your book that is going to aid the uh, ascension of planet Earth. It's going to speed up the process. And I said, okay. And, you know, within eight, eight to nine months, it became a bestseller. So, you know, it's all being orchestrated by the higher ups. I'm just an instrument. <laughs> But you wrote it seven years ago, and it just got released a year ago. So you would have wrote it like eight years ago at that point. Yeah, it was just been sitting. The manuscript just sat there for eight, almost seven years. Did and, you update anything uh, like before you actually published it? Uh, no, I probably went over it just to kind of do a little proofread before I sent it out to the editor. But uh, other than that, no, yeah, I didn't add anything. It was already complete. I mean, a lot of this book, a lot of the information in this book, is also revealing the future. Uh, the coming new world structure uh, it, that's going to exist within the age of Aquarius. You know, the how the Earth is going to be part of a federated region uh, with 22 regions. Um, I discuss and I reveal what uh, life is going to be like for the next 2,000 years. So it's also very prophetic in that sense. Okay, cool. And again, I, I want to remind people that there will be links for everything that we talk about. And so if people want to be able to purchase the book themselves, mm -hmm. The link will be down below. You can search for it on Amazon, Our Cosmic Origin. Now, I want to take it back into kind of like some of the things that you've been talking about in regards to the book. So for, before I do that, though, I wanted to ask, what is 
Project Restoration Zion. Okay, so the original word Zion goes back to the uh, the Priory of Zion, which was the inner core group that the Knights of the Templars were protecting, as revealed in the Da Vinci Code. It has to do with a uh, promise that was made, a established covenant that was made with Abraham and Archangel Melchizedek over 4,000 years ago. And it has to do with the establishment of the Commonwealth, which is what we call the Republic. However, the dark forces, the Cabal, always invert good things, you know. They obviously infiltrated the Masonic Lodges in the 1776 through Adam Weesaw, and they always invert these terminologies. And so, you know, Zion, to me, is the restoration, it is the promise that was left with Abraham uh, by Melchizedek, and, and that is also the promise that the Knights of the Temple, or the Knights Templars, who actually were the good guys during the Dark Middle Ages, resurrected as the millennial millennial project and they did you know the founding fathers were part of that part of that millennial project to establish the, the republic uh, the original masons before they were corrupted and infiltrated by the bavarians and the you know the jesuit priests and so to me zion means the restoration of heaven on earth it is a a covenant that was left with abraham long ago by archangel melchizedek and it has nothing to do with the kazarian bolshevik zionist of the rothschilds has nothing to do with those elite families. In fact, they inverted these words. That's what happens. Yeah. Everything gets inverted. You know, like I, I actually, I just heard about a, um, I think it was somewhere in the United States, there is a, a Buddhist monastery or some sort of, some sort of Buddhist uh, building, maybe not a monastery or a temple, but it had a, a swastika, which is very much associated with Buddhism. But that symbol got bastardized in, in Germany, obviously, and now everybody associates it with that. And they were actually talking about removing, like closing up this, they're actually closing up this facility. The people who owned it were, were to avoid that, we're going to have uh, them excavate and remove that stone that had that carving in it. But it's crazy how that hijacking took place. And it's also interesting that you that you mentioned McKiesel deck because from a biblical standpoint, he's kind of like this OG who like just steps in and steps out and just gets mentioned every once in a while. And you're like, who is this guy? Because for Abraham to have given him, I think he tithed to Mekizedek and um, they akin Mekizedek to the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Salem, and uh, almost like a precursor to what we know as Jesus, Yeshua. Yeah. So that, were you raised Christian or Catholic in, by any means? I was, I was. Okay, you're Hispanic, right? Uh, yes. So I was assuming the cat most his, most Hispanics are raised Catholic. Were you raised Catholic or was a Christian? Catholic. Okay. I'm, I I don't know if anybody ever asked you, but I was just curious about that uh, because a lot of times, you know, obviously we got to undo a lot of that conditioning to move forward to the frame of thinking of the stuff that you've been talking about. Now. But we also see Zion in the Matrix, right? The free world where the oh, humans yeah. free themselves from the machine world. Um, are, you know, they call themselves Zion, which is a, a place of refuge where freedom exists. So that's what Zion means to me. It's Project Restoration Zion to restore freedom back to the earth. I like that. I like that because I'm definitely a big proponent of freedom and sovereignty. So I love that. Um, now, okay, so we talked about the prime creator the universal architect and everything that we're dealing with. Now, obviously there seems to be kind of I, what I've started to notice is my, and this is you, you start to go down rabbit holes. You start doing your research at some point you start finding all these connections in the rabbit holes. Then you start realizing they're all just one big rabbit hole. And at the root of everything, it seems like the, 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 what this is all about is spiritual warfare. So a battle of yin and yang, just opposites, um, whether it's good, evil, light, darkness, however you want to perceive that. What is that opposition that we are facing that would be the opposite of prime creator? Because I've heard, I've heard you mention this, and it was also in the title of the leak um, project video, but um, Phantom AI, Ancient Phantom AI. 
Yeah, the the entire living or organic multiverse, cosmos, in which we're a part of, that was an extension of prime creator source, has been at war with artificial intelligence for billions of years. So the ultimate evil is not the cabal. It's not the wizards and sorcerers on top of the cabal. And it's not even the Alpha Draconis, you know, regressive uh, Orion groups that are above the cabal. But even above them, we're dealing with, with an AI. We're dealing with cybernetic artificial intelligences. You know, they are the reason why many, many universes have been afflicted and oppressed, why many hundreds of thousands of galaxies have been destroyed. And so that's what we're ultimately fighting. And we're starting to see this battle surfacing here in our world through the rise of our artificial intelligence and through the transhumanist agenda, which has to do with the ultimate evil that we're fighting. And how long is this AI god that you mentioned? And that's also kind of a an interesting term, just AI god. What made you define this or call this entity a, a, a god more than just uh, advanced or supreme AI? Well, that's what we call it in the, uh, you know, community of light. But to the regressives, to the Dracos, to the Zetas, to the Naboo, you know, the Zeta Reticulas, the uh, Montes, and all those regressives that have been afflicting our galaxy uh, beyond the Cabal, they call it the AI God. They answer to it as their Lord, as their God. But I agree with you. To me, it's not a God, but it is a powerful artificial force that is actually trying to compete with prime creator source. You know, it's trying to destroy all of the 15 dimensional time matrix while at the same time is uh, siphoning off the energy of the 15 dimensional time matrix in order to power up its own phantom matrix cybernetic multiverse that is developed. So in a way, it's like the ultimate cosmic vampire. It feeds off of living systems. But at the same time, it wants to access the realms of eternity, which is where prime creator source exists in order to destroy, you know, prime creator source and be the ultimate creator of all that is. So it's competing with prime creator source. That's why they, they call it the AI God. But yeah, I, I don't I don't even think it's a God. I think it's honestly it's, it's just a very advanced super machine with no soul that just went rogue. Well, would it be what, like the god of the simulation, of the of the finite realities? No, no, all... no, no, okay. no. The finite realities that we exist in or that we are experiencing are actually living simulations. In other words, we live in a conscious universe. We live in a conscious world. The planet is an entity. Everything is alive and aware. Rocks are all living entities, uh, even though they're all part of the simulation. The difference between a living simulation and an artificial cybernetic simulation is uh, that the artificial uh, cybernetic simulation is not connected to spirit or source. We are. You know, the plants have consciousness. Rocks have consciousness. Trees have consciousness. Planets, systems, source, you know, everything has consciousness. That's the difference. And that's really, I mean, that's really interesting to think about. This, like, the everything. Because, I mean, like, I could totally get that um, animals, plants, things that you think are alive like rocks and and gravity i wouldn't associate intelligence or consciousness with no oh, it is everything's conscious particles are conscious uh the magnet electromagnetic field of the planet is conscious um yeah you know if, if we could that's the reason we don't see things as conscious uh is because we were programmed we were programmed to think that everything that is inanimate is dead matter but in essence we're we're living in a in an ocean of pure consciousness where everything is alive. In fact, uh, Dr. Greg Braden, a uh, marvelous scientist, uh, you know, talks about this living matrix. He calls it the divine matrix, which is a field of intelligence which exists all around us. And it is when we tap into that field that we are able to access supernatural abilities because it's all around us. Okay. Uh, now, uh something else that i found very fascinating because i have like you know again i love looking into alternative history hidden history and it seems like from a our, the most that we know from the earliest civilization would come from your sumerian babylonian time period and there's a lot of mention of from the bible the fallen ones the nephilim 
which could be one and the same with the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki, there was, from what I know from lore, Anu was the father of the Anunnaki, and I could have this wrong based off, but I would love for you to correct me and kind of give me a better insight with this. But you have Anu, who's the who's the father, grandfather, and his sons were Inky and Enlil. Ink, and then there was Marduk, who is the son of Inky. And I, and then I got some interesting questions about Marduk too. But um, can you explain Anu, Inky, and Enlil from your perspective, and and then Marduk as well, like what their roles have been in in on our planet specifically? Sure. So the original Anunnaki comes from Sirius. Uh, it was an alliance that took place between the king of Lyra and the queen of Sirius B. They created a more powerful guardian lineage that was developed to protect and guard the entire Milky Way galaxy. And that explains why they created planet Nibiru. In its original makeup, Nibiru was known as the Battlestar planet for the Syrian High Council uh, and working for the Galactic Federation. So we, what we see here is uh, the original Anunnaki came from Sirius. They were very instrumental in their war against the Draco Orion Empire. However, during the Earth's second grand seating, uh, there was an infiltration through Draman, the Draco Orion queen of Alpha Centauri. I'm sorry, of the Thuban system, of the Thuban star system. Okay. She um, impregnated, I'm sorry, she got impregnated by, by Anu. And that's what Enki was born in. But, but she tricked him. She actually got him drunk. And she seduced him. And that's how Enki was born. That was part of the master plan by the Draco, Orion Empire, to infiltrate the Battlestar planet Nibiru. So Enki was, was, was Enki the first? Yeah, he was the first born of Anu. But he okay. wasn't here to the throne because Enki was part Draco. He was part Niberian, Pleiadian, Lyrian, Syrian, which is what Anu is, 100%. See, Anu carried a pure stock... Uh, that you could trace all the way back to the king of Lyra, Amelius. Amelius was the was the first incarnated version of Christ Michael, the logos of the universe. And so, through the line of Lyra and Sirius, the original Anuhasi, as to why they get the word Anunnaki, it's the Anuhasi family. And the Anuhasi family is also are um, very related to the the family of Jesus and Mary Magdalene and King David, which was. Um, transferred over to our world through Enlil, Enlil Seuss. So basically, Enki was born, he was part of the infiltration, uh, and, you know, he was actually the guy, the reason why Atlantis fell. And through his son Marduk, who became known as the god of Babylon, Belial Baal, Satan, uh, were able to hijack the control of the earth from the guardians, from the original Anunnaki Anuhasi lineage, uh, and then that's why we've been experiencing this suffering for thousands of years. However, Enlil, Zeus, was the rightful heir to the throne. And to the Greeks, he was known as Zeus. He was the chief guardian of the earth. But you have to understand, as, as chief guardian of the earth, he, he, and as the heir to the Niberian uh, council, he was also protecting over 200,000 other solar systems. And that explains why Nibiru came into an orbit and it had an elliptical orbit of 3,600 years because when it, it wasn't functioning, when it wasn't here within our vicinity, it was out patrolling other solar systems uh, pertaining to the, gal the galaxy and those that were aligned with the Federation. So Enlil Seuss was actually the heir to the throne and he, and through his lineage, uh, he, you know, was able to uh, deposit a pure line that could be traceable back to Anu, uh, Amelius from Lyra, and then, of course, Michael, the archangel. And through his lineage, we had King David, Solomon. And then, of course, you know, the house of David that gave us Jesus and Mary Magdalene and so on and so forth. You know, when you mentioned it too, like the rightful heir to the father's, what the father was, uh, what king, whatever the situation might be, that kind of reminded me of the story of Jacob and Esau as well, because it's very, very much parallels. Is there any, is there any actual parallelization does it does it is there any correlation into two yeah es esau was uh had a reptilian genetics in him you know he comes from the line of cain uh cain was uh, the father of cain was Enki. the father you know abel was actually um the father of abel or the the first human was um 
Oh, no, Adam. I'm sorry, Adam, not Abel. Was yeah, Adam and Adam and Annie gave yeah. birth to Cain, Abel, and Seth. Yeah, exactly. Well, Cain was actually the father of Cain was uh, Enki. Enki represents the lineup Lucifer Draco. Right, Enki would be what we so he represents Lucifer. You saying that's the serpent in the garden, Absolutely. the firstborn of Anu, and his son is Marduk, who's also known as Baal or Satan. Baal or Satan. Yeah. So there is, you see a distinguish, a difference between Lucifer and Satan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Or in other words, Marduk is the sign of Enki. Yeah. And Enki is the cosmic vampire. Absolutely. Yes. Where Enlil is the one who breathed consciousness into us Absolutely. from the story of Garden of Eden. Yeah. The original manuscript, yeah, revealed that. But they were tampered with uh, by the priesthood of Baal, Baliel Marduk. And then that's why when Sakurai Sitchin translated it, you know, they flipped the whole story around. They made Enlil Seuss look like the bad guy. But read other accounts, like the Greek version, he was Seuss. He was the, the chief guardian of the earth, head of the Olympian gods. Okay. So he hailed from Mount Olympus. Uh, he was known as the, the sky god. He was known as the, uh, he, the god of the mountains. You know, he was the one who parted the Red Sea for Moses. He was the one who gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And he was the one that was uh, helping the Israelites... Um, get to the promised land okay now um these individuals the inky the enlil and marduk did they did they live or are they still alive did they live for long periods of time into our recent history well through the lineage of enlil Seuss, uh he came back as christ christ is another version of enlil because again this could go this Lineage could be traceable back to the oversoul of our omnipotent king and uh, overseer of our local universe, Christ Michael. Uh, so that's why some people say Christ and Michael are one and the same. Because Archangel it, Michael? But as far as like the descendants of Marduk and uh, Enki, they, they, uh, they joined the AI, you know, transhumanists. So yeah, Marduk has actually been eliminated. He's, he's been killed. But Enki decided to become cybernetic. Enki has gone AI. While Enlil, Seuss, is now reincarnated as one of us. He's, he's actually here in human form. Enlil is reincarnated into a human flesh meat suit, and he's currently on the planet Earth, planetary yeah. number 606. Exactly. And he, he was incarnated in the same lineage that he left behind for King David and Solomon and Jesus. So he comes from the line of the Holy Grail. Which, Will this have anything to do with like the prophecy of Revelation when it talks about a second coming of Christ? Oh, yeah, because uh, he's the one who's going to lead the war against the Antichrist, which is AI, which is Anki. Anki is AI, <laughs> you know. He's but it's taking the battle back to the brothers again in the end. Exactly. And in the end, the, you know, the righteous win against the ones that have uh, temporarily controlled our world for thousands of years. And all these negative uh, entities feed on our human energy, which is known as Lush. Absolutely. And, and Enki was a big part of that. Enki was the one who uh, set up this, this uh, Lush farm here on this planet by creating the black box in space, uh, manipulating us through the moon and the, the rings of Saturn to keep us in this low vibration to continue the suffering so that his, his family, the Dracos, could feed off of us. That was all done by Enki. That's why, but he's not, he not just did, did that in our world. He did that across many different solar systems. And that's why he's known as the cosmic vampire because, you know, he's been living off of our louche, not only us, but over, over uh, I think over thousands and thousands of systems were, were uh, controlled by Enki and, and they were all feeding him louche to feed the. That's, and that's really bizarre. Now, also, you mentioned with Marduk that he was around, obviously, during the Mesopotamian Sumerian time periods, and that he edited the Sumerian tablets in Babylon, which would be why that someone like Zachary Stinchin would have read or translated the uh, tablets in the way that he did. You said also that he orchestrated, basically, since for, I'm adding this in, since the death of Christ, which was the birth of the Ro the real, what we know of as the Roman Empire, which became the Holy Roman Empire, you said he's been controlling the Vatican and he was behind Constantine and all that. Can you elaborate briefly on that? Yes. Yeah, so all roads lead to Rome. So basically the Catholic Church is the reorganization of Babylon, the whore of the earth, you know, um, and at the head of Babylon, you had Marduk. 
and technically Marduk has been at the head of the Kabbalah for, for thousands of years until recently when he's when he was dethroned from Nibiru. So Nibiru luckily has now been restored back to the Syrian High Council as Enlil and the 144,000 uh, and the starseed nations begin to rise any day now. Now you said Marduk is no longer with us? No, he's he's been disposed. From your understanding, who disposed of Marduk? Um, some of the super soldiers, some of the super soldiers that were working for Radiant Guardians took him out, took him out. And I have to ask you a half serious question. Mm -hmm. One of these individuals wouldn't be known by the name of Kim Gogan. Would, would it? Are you familiar uh, with Kim Gogan? I don't really know much about her. People have been asking me about her. Um, honestly, I don't know who she is. I don't, I don't really know who she is. I don't okay. know the level. But uh, I heard that she claims to have killed Marduk and that she's replacing him. Um, I have no clue of that. But um, from what I understand, he was actually killed by a male, not a female. <laughs> so I don't know if she's making that up. <laughs> or on this planet, did, I mean, did Marduk, was he assassinated, killed? Was it on Earth or did it take place somewhere else in the cosmos? It took place on Nibiru. Yeah, he's, he's okay. on Nibiru. And he's been the... Um, the, the force behind the dark fleet and the interplanetary corporate conglomerate, which are the nefarious uh, groups, you know, breakaway groups of the secret space program. Okay. And I appreciate you, you know, the, the Kim Gogan thing is, uh, and maybe if you're interested, I can fill you in. Uh, she became a friend of mine. Um, I had actually went to her home and visited her, uh, as the open-minded skeptic, I was like, prove, prove this stuff, please. You know, I mean, it's you're you're making some some very interesting claims. You know, which you know, if if this is reality, can you can you show me some information that backs this up? And and just uh, even when she and she did tell me that, um, and she's talked about it in many other videos that she was the one that killed Marduk. That Marduk was in charge of the financial system and um and the and the families here on Earth and. It's really, really bizarre and interesting things, but I just never got any real, like, substantial evidence or proof to really back any of this stuff up. Um, she's really nice, but I don't think that what she claims as to who Marduk is, uh, there's not a lot of parallel to what you're, you're kind of mentioning as, except for the fact that he would just be considered a bad guy a negative entity in that aspect well she is right he's been in control of the shadow government of the cabal families for millenniums uh including the dark nefarious programs of these breakaway groups so she's right in that regard but um as far as her killing him no it was it was one of the super soldiers an ultra soldier that uh, was working with with radiant guardians okay Okay, well, I mean, definitely what I need to do, man, uh, since, you know, I just started recently becoming familiar with you is, you know, I definitely need to get a copy of the book and check that out and, re and read it and maybe bring you back on and ask you some questions from there. Um, before we do wrap up, I just got a few, few little short questions. Um, in order for us to ascend, and you said that not everybody would be in this category, from a psychological standpoint, you you said something that I like to reiterate a lot that our perception is our reality. So how you perceive things is going to be your reality. And that may differ from other people, but that is the basis of psychology for us to ascend. You mentioned that part of that ascension process would have something to do with activating our DNA, that our DNA has been manipulated and that we should have 12 strands of DNA. What, and then you also mentioned a great solar flash, solar flare. Um, is it great solar flash? Yeah, so great solar flash. So how does all this come in together with the ascension, with the 12 strands of DNA, the solar flare, the great solar flare, and, and things to that effect for our ascension? Well, it's, it's all working together. The great solar flash known as the event is going to be the trigger that's going to activate our dormant DNA and rebundle the other 10 strands, which is going to allow us to go from a carbon-based humanoid mortal to a um, crystalline-based, you know, galactic, uh, or as what scientists call neonauticus, ne neo yeah, neonauticus, uh, full-strand DNA immortal. It's the trigger. The trigger is the solar flash. 
a hundred percent to solar flash because i mean it, we're speculating but you're but based off your research there will be a great solar flash and that will be what activates our dna do you have any sort of time frame of these events i'm going to stick to my original prophecy as i revealed in my book our cosmic origin uh, by no later than 2024 but it could happen sooner it could happen okay. well I definitely don't want you to re reveal too much i mean i appreciate you having this discussion with me i think it you know kind of having it from this perspective of not reading the book and then learning about you i think hopefully helps put together questions that doesn't really reveal too much or take away from your book oh no there's so much knowledge in that book that book is so dense i mean even what i revealed here doesn't cover the uh, one percent in that book well I'm, then I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to digging into it thank you. sometimes people have to read it more than once to really grasp it because it's just so much material in that book so much information totally makes sense uh our cosmic origin knowledge and preparation for the ascension of our planet written by mr ismael perez i want to go ahead and be re uh, very respectful of your time and hopefully that you'll be um open to coming back on after i have a chance to dive into the book um do you have any final thoughts or anything that you want to add to today's conversation before we do wrap up my friend uh, yes, I also teach an online course called Starseed Cosmology Course. My classes are booked all the way to December, so I might have some openings left in December for those that really want to know if, uh, first of all, if wh whether or not they're a starseed, uh, second of all, what kind of starseed you're, you're, uh, you are, and then third of all, um, you know, I teach methods and techniques that help you connect to your galactic self so that you could become multidimensional in this course. It's called the Starseed Cosmology Course, and I think you have the link for that as well, correct? I do. So um, what I want to share here is if, if people were to go to your Instagram account, there'll be a link for the mysticarts.org. And it, is that the site that you're referring to, Ismail? Yes. Yes. Okay. So here's the mysticarts.com. If you want to briefly, and there's also a, not only a YouTube, not, not only a website, the mysticarts.org, there's also a YouTube channel, which makes up some of the various teachers that teach on the mystic arts. Do you mind kind of giving a brief explanation as to what the mystics arts is all about? Yeah, it's restoring the ancient mystery schools back to the earth is, you know, teaching people a higher level of cosmology, uh, galactic information, astrology. Uh, we, they even have twin flame classes if you want to learn more about twin flames. Uh, they teach elemental magic so you could begin to learn with the elements just to name a few of the classes that we teach. So basically we're, this is a, a synthesis of, uh, you know, the Jedi Academy School of Light to learn, to teach people how to activate their Jedi abilities. Jedi School of Light, I love it. Yeah, and, and of course the, the, the School of Harry Potter, all in one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good addition. So this is the uh, Starseed Cosmology course that you were talking about? Correct. Okay, and you said that you, may have openings as soon as would be december yes but people could find out just by going over to uh, the mysticarts.org and going on to bookings uh, or classes and they'll be able to get that information correct correct yes okay cool cool and um what about the youtube channel what can people expect to find on the youtube channel because i've noticed you know there's a variety of different people uh including yourself but you're not on everything so this is obviously not your youtube channel but what can people expect to find over at the mystic arts youtube channel well we do have a youtube channel uh where once a week uh, me and my uh, colleague taylor fortune we discuss uh many topics we answer questions it's called the divine masculine channel so it's a collective channel that i share with my colleagues and co-teachers of the mystic arts uh three of my other colleagues are women and they are the ones that teach these other courses as well so yeah we're all working together as different teachers within the arts it's the way to do it work together teamwork makes the dream work right absolutely all right so again i will have links down below for everything that we talked about on today's show and if you just bear with me one second it's my i'm just going to wrap up the recording and talk to you for just a moment Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you're checking out Ismael's book, Our Cosmic Origin. Links will be down below for everything I talked about on today's show, uh, including his Instagram account if you want to follow him directly. 
uh, definitely check out the return. I'm going to be doing it. I'm going to be reading the book and hopefully uh, doing a follow up interview with Mr. Ismael Perez. If this is your first time watching any of my videos, I do encourage you to check out and explore my channel. I have three different shows on one channel, a little bit of something for everybody. This is part of the Stranger Than Fiction series. So I do appreciate you tuning in and I'm going to go ahead and wrap up and leave you with this. I encourage you to be a blessing to others. Treat people how you want to be treated. Be the change you want to see in this world. Practice change. Beautifully said.